Hey everybody, what's up? This is Ari in the Air. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for being here. Today, I want to take you through a flight that I had last season that was one of my deepest lines I've ever flown. It was my longest flight from my home site of Pine Mountain. It's also still the longest duration flight I've ever had. And it contains the greatest thermal of my life. So there's also a bunch of lessons in there in low saves and deep lines and persistence. So I'm really stoked to show it to you. A lot of things we can learn. I'm going to use Avery again to show you some of the things that I did and where I flew and how it all worked out. And I've got some great outside footage of my uh, reaction in the landing field. And so I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay, ready? Here we go. Yeah. Right. If you like these videos, thank you. Thanks for watching. I love making them and you liking watching them closes the loop. So if you want to support this channel, uh, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. The next 20 top tier members of on Patreon are going to get this sick airy in the air paragliding buff. It contains some really hilarious stuff like, like this. The paraglider getting beamed up into the spaceship, which is quite relevant right now, right? With all the UFO talk out there. Okay, so let's get into this flight here on Avery. Okay, so we're here on the south side of Pine Mountain. This is a launch called Firefly. Whoa, it's going really fast. Okay, so we're going to go back. Okay, so here I am. So I've launched off of Firefly, which is really not a super high launch. Um, there's not a lot of relief here, but there is a lot of thermals here. As you can see, let's pause it for a sec. As you can see, there's like this big circle around this launch. There was a big sagebrush fire. I happened to be soaring the summit of the mountain at midnight under a full moon and the back of the mountain was on fire. That's literally where I was when this fire was burning. I was soaring on the summit, which is right here. This was on fire. So we had the moon on one side and we had this huge plume of red fiery smoke on the other. It was fucking crazy. <laughs> so... Um, here is eight times speed. Let's slow it down because what I want to show you is Pine Mountain is like an incredible place to fly cross country from, but it is not that easy of a place to get out of. And this goes to show. So I launched and I basically, I actually, it's funny because I have two track logs from the same day. I basically launched and I flew around and I went to the other side and I came back and I top landed because it wasn't working. Okay, so here's my second launch and I've launched and I made one little circle and I'm basically flying out and I'm sinking, sinking, sinking. The LZ is this little cleared square here and I'll put it into four times speed. And at this point, and this is actually a little bit deceiving because on Avery here, it shows you how high off the ground I am, but it's actually a bit deceiving because if I were to land right here, I would only be like halfway down this. So I'm even lower than it looks and I'm out. I just... Don't think it's going to work. Two people have already launched and, and just bombed straight out and it wasn't working. So I was like, oh, well, we're going down, whatever. And so I fly out over the LZ and I find some kind of zero and I turn in it and I go back and I turn in it and I go back and I turn in it and I go back. So this, like um, the last video, there's some low saves involved. This is another low save and... I'm in a, you know, less than one meter a second climb that goes up to one and a half. That's about to climb. It's going to turn. It's going to turn on into a two. Here it is a two and we can speed up. We can get out of here. So basically my longest flight starts with a totally low save that I didn't believe was going to work, but I climb out and I climb out and I climb out. We'll zoom out here. Okay. Climbing out. Okay, so at this point now, my two friends that I went to the mountain with that day, Sarah and Colin, are both on the ground. They tried to fly 
out, but they landed. And so now I get on the radio and I feel a little bit guilty and I say, Hey, sorry guys. Like, what do I do? Should I land? And they say, no, fucking crack it off, man. We'll follow you. I say, all right, here we go. Big day, big day. That's always like the kind of like the permission I need. Yeah. We'll follow you. Go crack it off, Harry. Careful what you wish for friends. So we'll speed this up a bit because this, I'm just like, you know, there's nothing too interesting here. I can show you a, a pretty good, um, like terrain decision here. I get a nice climb here up to like 11,000 feet. I'm gonna slow it down to 32 times. And I'll show you here on this next crossing, what I'm looking for and what I typically look at as I leave Pine Mountain. So basically if you look here uh, directly to the east, there's this very subtle piece of terrain here, very subtle. It's really not that huge. It's maybe 150 feet tall. But anytime that I'm flying in the area, I'm going to fly over this because it's all flat all around it. It's the only piece of terrain. So it's the best chance that I have. It's the only thing that I'll like really like, you know, that I'm going to fly over. It's pretty deep. Like there's not like all the roads out here are totally dirt and no one's going to drive by and pick you up. So, but you just, you fly over the piece of terrain that's there. Um, you know, there's a great quote in McClurg's new book, Advanced Paragliding, that says something like, all of the triggers that you see in the mountains are in the flats, but they're just a lot softer and a lot more subtle. So we're not in the mountains. We don't have a huge peak that we know it's going to fire off of, but we do have a very subtle little piece of terrain. So we fly over that piece of terrain and sure enough there, I find it. So this day I'm flying by myself and it's blue. There's no clouds indicating lift. And so this is a very, very challenging day. So we'll speed it up to 64 times here. And I'm basically going to like boop around and I'm really not flying super fast right now. I'm really trying to stay alive because I'm by myself and it's blue and I'm not exactly sure where to go. So you're going to see that I turn around a lot, that I look for things. If I get into a zero, I take little tiny climbs here. I get a decent climb taking it. This is a little town called brothers. I keep gliding and you'll see like, as I get low here, we can just slow it down. As I get low, I basically am turning out to the highway because it's like the lower I get, I'm just going to make my retrieve, my walk out. I'm not going to like dive deep into terrain looking for climb or I'm not going to dive deep away from the highway looking for a climb. I'm just going to glide back to the highway. Just keep it easy for myself. You know, it's like, you know, I've flown, this is my home site. I don't really need to like scratch too hard. I don't need to make a big problem for myself. I do have people following me, which is nice. Um, and eventually I find a climb and I get away from the highway. So this is a main highway. And basically from this point forward, things are going to get a lot deeper. It's not that there's no roads, but there's not very traveled roads, a lot of dirt roads. Um, so anything paved, I'm going to follow pretty closely. And we're going to see that affect my flight trajectory here pretty soon. So we'll speed it up to 64 times. Keep it going. And see right here, this actually that we just saw, this was like typically like if I was in a comp, I would never do this pattern here, right? I'm really like, I've already topped out this last climb and I'm already going down and I'm still going down and I'm kind of like looking for it. And I kind of like just look for it too long and I like make a loop and that's just all wasting altitude and time. I should have just been going downwind. I should have just been going and gliding. And that's always like kind of the, one of the cruxier parts of flying cross country is like, at what point do you like search around for it? And at what point do you just glide? That was a moment I should have been gliding because as you see here, like half a mile later, I find a decent climb that takes me up, you know, a thousand or two. So keep speeding up. So there's small terrain in front of me and I'm basically just for still flying flatland desert thermals here. And as the terrain is going to develop in front of me, it's going to get a little bit more pronounced or what I think is easier. And it's going to lead us into the greatest thermal of my life and a big lesson for me. So um, I think there's a paved road back here. 
but here I'm finding more climb. Things are going pretty well. It's high pressure, it's blue, it's difficult. Okay, so I'm gonna slow this down a bit here and we're gonna look at this glide. So right here, this like what looks like a white mountain in the picture is actually like this very vibrant green. It's crazy and as I flew close to it, I thought I was gonna land and I took a picture of it. So I'm gonna pull up a picture here of it Hopefully we can find it. And it's like super incredible and mind blowing. And I never knew it was there. And it was such a wonderful thing to find in flight. But besides that, here's this piece of terrain, right? We can see it's not gigantic. It's not gigantic, this piece of terrain. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, but it's basically what I've got. And so I'm going to fly towards it and I'm going to fly over it. And I'm going to hope that it produces a thermal. But what I find is that it's a really peaceful glide. Like there's nothing. There's not even anything that I even remotely close to turn around for. Um, and at this point, I'm kind of deep, but there is a paved road back here. So I'm thinking, well, you know, like it wasn't a huge flight, but I gave it a shot. So right here, you see, I did a loop hoping that it was going to produce. And then I fly over more of the terrain, hoping that's going to somehow kick off. And maybe, ooh, found nothing, blah. Not really anything. So real here, I'm kind of like hopeful and I maybe have found a zero that I'm humping, right? I call it humping zeros when you're just like in not sync and you're trying to like maintain in not sync. But what I'm going to try to describe to you is what I call being spit out. And I would love to tell you that there's a technique for how to be spit out. And I think there kind of is. And I, every time I fly, I kind of like am honing in on this technique of how to be spit out. Because on the last video that I made about my flight, on another really low save, I made the analogy that if a plastic bag is being sucked into a thermal, a plastic bag just lets itself be pulled into wherever the air is in training. And that's kind of the effect that you'd need to embody you kind of need to embody that plastic bag think of the plastic bag be the plastic bag what i mean to say there is that you have to let yourself get sucked into the sink or the zeros follow the sink follow the zeros I've heard a lot of people talk about if you're flying in sync you need to turn 45 or 90 degrees away from the wind so that you fly out of the sink. Well, I can't confirm or deny that. I think that really talented pilots have said that and I don't really know, but what I've experienced and what I experienced on this day was that I followed the sink and I just followed it downwind and the wind changed slightly and the sink, as we can see here, I'm, I kind of like him in zeros here and kind of not really finding it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to follow the sink. I'm going to let it entrain me. Here I'm flying to the road. I'm not yet following the sink. I think that maybe I'm finding it here. Okay. So it's really light here now. And let's zoom out a little bit so I can show you. Okay. So basically if we zoom out, you can see my track log. So I flew away from this terrain. I was really hoping that this terrain would produce because that was kind of like my last chance. You can see all of this mountain here is very interesting and eroded and like the, the rock is very green in here. It's cool. So basically what's going to happen is I just kind of follow the sink and it turns into zeros. And then I try to make really super flat, efficient turns. I'm flying an ozone LM six E and D three liner. And it's like, so touchy and so beautiful. It really feels the air really well. Best three liner I've ever flown. And I basically just let myself be entrained into it. And here I just like kind of found something and I humped some zeros and I kind of just like let myself go downwind. Now I'm just like in something. I'm in something and it's like consistently something. And so I try to kind of core it here. Let's zoom in and I keep going downwind with it and just stay with it. And just stay with it. Now it's like, it's very light climb at this point. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. 
Okay, so now it's turned into two meters a second. Now it's turned into three meters a second. Three and a half meters a second. Four meters a second. Five meters a second. Six meters a second. I'm passing 3,000 meters. 3,500 meters. Holy shit, look at that freaking climb. Okay, I'll keep playing because I'm still going up. Look at that. 4,000 meters. 4,200 meters. 4,300 meters. 4,300 meters. Look at that. Okay, so that's 14,108 feet right there, top of that climb. So I just went up 10,000 feet. 10,000 feet <laughs> from the ground. <laughs> and look, I got spit out. This is what I mean when I got spit out. So like my glide into here, it was just sink. It was just sink. It was just sink. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. But I just let it take me where it wanted to take me. As you can see, there's terrain on both sides of this. It's like it's normal to think that it would venturi through here and release right here. It kind of makes sense when we look back at it. My perception of it was that it should release on the bigger terrain that I tried at first. But our perceptions in reality are often different things. So this climb was at the strongest six and a half meters a second. It was perfectly smooth. The entire thing, perfectly smooth. As you can see, we can almost look at it from the top. The circles are just like perfectly consistent. It was just it hardly drifted and it was just like the best thermal of my life from the ground to 14,200 feet. It's hard for me to tell you how to get spit out, but I guess the key, f the key things that I think about when I'm trying to get spit out or when I'm low is follow the sink. Obviously I use my speed to fly in the sink. So if I'm like going down negative four meters a second, I'm on full speed bar. And when that starts changing, I start letting off of my speed bar pretty, you know, quickly so that I can be sensitive to the rising air and so that I'm not losing more altitude and flying faster than I should be. The other thing is I want to be sensitive to slight changes in direction. If the wind changes direction slightly when I'm low to the ground, I think that it's because it's taking me towards the climb, right? If the thermal is sucking here, it's normal that even though the met wind might be from the north, that it would change slightly and be northwest or something, right? So letting my glider sniff when I'm low and looking for it, letting myself be entrained into sync and using speed to fly to be efficient, as well as when I find myself in zeros or really light climb to be very efficiently turning, flat turning, I'm going to embody that plastic bag as well as letting myself drift downwind as much as I can when I'm really looking for it. Because the zeros, basically the, the principle is that lift leads to lift. So if it's light lift, follow it and it'll become more lift. And so that's what I did here. I, I followed the point ones and the point twos that turned into point eight, that turned into a one, that turned into a two, that turned into a three, to a four, to a five, to a six, to a six and a half, to fucking 14,000 feet. Spit right out. Let's keep going. And what happens after you get spit out to 14,000 feet? You glide through negative five meters a second sink. And yeah, you should be expecting that. If there's this huge thermal right here and you go downwind, like you're going to go over the waterfall and you're going to go into a bunch of sink. You better be ready to push full speed and glide as far as you can. But what's going to happen at the far side of that glide is something that you probably expect, which is another super sick, strong, consolidated, thermal downwind from the last one the atmosphere has a rhythm folks it has a rhythm it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down so it's like do you turn off of sync and go the other way well not really i don't because like if i was in climb and then i go and i go downwind through sync that means i'm going downwind towards the next climb so i don't really worry about that too much right if strong sync i I've learned to kind of like strong sync. It shows me that I'm, I'm heading towards something strong. 
It doesn't go down unless it's going up somewhere else, you know? Okay, so just to just to check in with how I'm physiologically doing, I'm really quite deep here. You see there's some uh, there's some some farm fields around the area. This is a municipality referred to as Palina, and it's quite deep. Um, obviously there are roads, there's a paved road here and which makes me feel quite good. And I'm kind of following it here and I'm getting lower and lower. I'm at 6,500 feet. And what is happening now in the flight is that my condom catheter has fallen off. And I'm not sure whether to end my flight over that or not. And I decide that no, I don't want to end my flight. So I need to do something radical, which this is the perfect climb for it. You see, I'm in a very light 200 foot per minute climb and I'm just turning circles. And basically what I'm doing, <laughs> this is the, the gritty details of how this kind of flight happens. Remember this flight was seven hours, 21 minutes. So I had to fucking deal with my physiology on this thing. <laughs> so I basically have my condom catheter fall off. Really got to pee. So I'm halfway through my, you know, I'm three and a half hours into the flight. So I basically undo my cockpit, undo my, my pod. I like lean over out of my pod harness. I grab my poor dick by the nape of its neck and I drag it over the side of the harness. And I'm like pulling on the harness with one hand and I'm like stretching my cock out to maximum extension with the other. And I'm like leaned over in this light climb and I'm, just pissing over the side of the harness, which is quite difficult when you're like punishing your dick like that. But I ended up getting a pee. <laughs> which saves the flight, right? I continue flying out of this light climb. That's basically me just trying to pee and I'm just like circling around for it. And now I'm going the other direction. Where the Where am I going? Oh no, <laughs> okay, it's turned around. So you can, and finally I find a climb. So this is where the flight is going to get pretty uh, lonely for me because my friends, Sarah and Colin, have not followed me back into here because they think that I'm going to fly across this entire mountain range that's in front of me and land somewhere near Dayville. We can see Dayville here. And that's really sweet of them because they believe in me and at this point I don't believe in me and I'm bummed that they didn't just like follow me on this road because if they were back here I could hear them on the radio and I would probably just land and get into the car because I'm tired and I'm lonely and it's been hard but I eked out a pee I think I ate a bar and the climbs really aren't like super producing here I'm at 8,000 feet so it's not not working but I basically have this glide up onto this mesa and I remember this specifically because I remember seeing wild horses up here. There were wild horses running around and this, what's showing water was not water. It was dried out. This was on the 31st of July. So it was hot. I got a little climb and you can see I'm really searching around for it, really trying to make it work. And I'm just kind of like frisbeeing here and I think I get really low and finally I find like a climb and then I actually find a climb. Okay. So I'm, there's a road right here under me at this point. And I'm like, sweet, I'll just take this Frisbee climb and I'll just follow this road, which makes perfect sense to me. Following the road, following the road, following the road. And now I'm getting low again. Let's slow it down a little and keep playing. And what this is right here is a campground and it's the end of the road. Um, because the wind is pushing me this way towards Dayville, towards Aldrich Mountain. And so, as you can see, I'm basically like thermal up and then I push forward because I really don't want to go downwind into tiger country yet. I'm not feeling like committing to that. I'm hungry and lonely and tired and scared. But there is a little bit of road back here so I can kind of push it up onto this little mesa. And I know that this is all rural road back here. And if I really want to cross that, there's going to be some pretty serious tiger country stuff back here. It's not that there's no roads. It's just that if I land back here, 
My friends are going to have to use their GPS to come get me. There's no radio contact. There's no cell phone service. I'm basically going to have to sit in place for three, four more hours. It's not a great situation. So basically I take this little Frisbee and I take it and I work it. And at this point, like I, the, my problem with Avery right now is that it's actually not showing me what time it is in my flight, but it's late. It's like 5 PM. Um, I think, Look, I'm passing 9,000 feet here, which is really making me feel super warm and fuzzy. The climb was really light for a long time and then finally consolidated. But I get really freaking tall right here. And I got a text message from my friend Josh Finkelstein. And he said something like, wow, 13,000 feet at 6 p.m. And I was like, yeah, woo. And so it's really, it's quite late. And as you see, let's speed it up a bit. I just like really am trying to work this and I'm really not trying to lose this. So when you're in a climb that you really want and you don't want to lose it, a couple of tips for you. One, embody that plastic bag. Two, make really flat turns. Three, don't stop turning. Like keep turning. Keep keeping doing circles and letting yourself be drifted by the wind is how you embody that plastic bagness that you have deep inside of your heart's heart. There's a plastic bag in there, folks. You're living in a modern age, okay? We all have plastic bags in our hearts. So letting yourself go downwind of the climb itself, like really like paying attention to which way the climb is going. And then when you run out of climb, like take it downwind from the climb, right? Because like I've said in advanced thermaline, I have a video called advanced thermaline. We talk about how the thermal can go up and they get compressed and pushed in the wind and then release again. So like really like it might be connected, but it might just be slightly downwind of itself. So really staying on that downwind line. So also frisbee, this is like the plastic bag. Okay. And I went downwind and then it got a lot better here. The climb is actually steep and I'm getting tall right here. Let's go into this. This is, you know, it's two and a half. It's three meters a second. And I'm getting up there. I'm at 4,500 meters here, which I wish I could change each thing. This is 15,000 feet. And so what just happened? I was the loneliest and scaredest I had been in a long time. Super deep, super hungry, super tired. I didn't want to go deeper. I definitely didn't want to go deep low. I frisbeed the climb. I embodied the plastic bag. I thought about killing myself. I got climbed 14 something thousand feet. I make this massive crossing of super like rugged tiger country. I'm pretty much eyeing this road that goes through this canyon the whole time. And I'm thinking, oh my God, if I land in the canyon, at least like maybe I can walk to the road and yada yada. And it's like, it's just, it was pretty real. So now I'm down sub 10,000 feet. And I'm kind of like, we'd look kind of not sh exactly sure where to go. I find more climb. Look at that. I find more climb going up 500 feet a minute. That'll do it. So now I'm getting up 10, six, 10, seven. Okay. Let's speed it up here. Let's go 64 times. Wah, 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 wah. 11, four, 11, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12, five, 13,000 feet, F almost 14,000 feet. I push it onto Aldrich mountain. And this, now we're late. Like it's at least 6 p.m. right now. And so what's happening here? Look at this mountain range that I'm about to cross. What's happening right now? It's 6 p.m. And the air has been unstable enough for me to get here. So what's happening? These mountains are going off. They're totally exploding. And so I'm thinking, eh, man, I'm going to like land in Dayville or maybe Mount Vernon. But then I get on top of these mountains and the glide is just crazy. I'm downwinding like mad. I shouldn't be turning right here. Like this is a mistake. This is a mistake turning right here. Basically my feeling of scarcity that I just had in the deepest tiger country moment of my life is like still affecting me because I'm turning right here and I should not be turning. I should be downwinding on speed bar because it's going off. It's glassing off. There's so much lift. This is such a buoyant line. I should be pointing it straight down these mountains and over the strawberries because I could have made 200 K easily this day, but in, I was just exhausted. I was so smoked and I was tired and I just started pushing full speed and I just started running and 
here I am. I'm just like, I'm not going down at all. I'm on full speed. I'm just crushing it, cruising. I'm t- making turns, which is stupid and I shouldn't be. But basically at this point, once I get on top of the mountains, I have a radio transmission from Sarah. She says, hey, Ari, do you copy? And I was like, oh my God, people. Oh, people, thank God I'm alive. You don't know what I've been through. <laughs> They're like, yeah, like we're almost to John Day. I'm like, yay, I'll see you in John Day. So at that point, my sights are set. It's like, it's done. I, Even though I could have gone farther by staying on the mountains and just continuing to glide downwind, I'm like, I'm going to John Day. You can't stop me. So let's zoom in here. And of course, you get to John Day, you get to your landing field, what happens? Plus four, like huge, huge lift. Anytime you want to land at the end of your tire day, you're going to find huge lift. Okay, so then we can talk about my landing field decision here, which is uh, the one of the last and quite entertaining parts of my flight here. So, as you see right below me, there's this big, gigantic open field here that my cursor's on. That's where I should land. It's really great there. But there's also this here. Um, it's like an RV park. And there's a giant wire (laughs) power line across the field. And you would think that would be enough for me to go land somewhere more open, but it's green grass. Okay, you see, this is my, my flight is over now. So you can see that how far I am from the ground is a bit deceiving. Um, But now we can go to the ground cam and see my reaction. Paraglide is fucking retarded. I can't believe how deep I was. Honestly, when I was like, I'm fucking south of Dayville. Please, there's a road in the canyon. I might land in the canyon. I was just like, fuck. I just want to squeak it out as close to fucking 26 as possible. You're like, okay, we'll meet you in Dayville. I'm like, I'm going to try to make it at fucking four meters a second to 15 grand. I was like, ha, I guess I'm fucking flying to John Day. (laughs) See you in John Day. What the fuck? I was so scared. (laughs) I was bonking, I was over it, I had been fucking uncomfortable, my condom catheter fell off in Polina. Polina? So like how much pee did you get on you? Uh, not much on me. The harness is something that no one else should touch. But, <laughs> and Matt, <laughs> this is Matt's harness, Matt's glider. Just like, he's like, the harness is yours now, dude. The harness is yours now. Yeah, no, I got a spray that makes it smell that ass. Yeah, sure, sure. It just gets so much UV and air that it just. But yeah, today was another toddler freaking car seat day, just like <laughs> spilling crumbs of my fucking bars and peeing all over myself <laughs> and shit. Just like, you know, your typical cross country pergler flight. Apple stickers? Um, you know, I didn't have an apple. I think that was actually one of my faux pas in my nutrition today because I did have my freaking pro bar for lunch. Like I asked the universe, I was like, please universe tomorrow, if I could just have a pro bar for lunch, that would be great. But the one I got was fucking too sweet for me. I also know now that like, realistically, I need a caffeinated bar. Every bar needs to be caffeinated. There's just no reason for me not to have fucking 50 milligrams of caffeine every time I eat a snack. Just give it to me. Right? Just give it to me. I arrived at John and Day, like, fucking back in the next, I was just like, <laughs> Stuff it into the park! I'm like, no, I'm not gonna stop, I'm gonna go crash into the RV park. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Can you, can you tell me about the landing zone that you know we're in? Tell you know me, please worse? tell me about the landing zone. You know what's worse is I saw the wire from a long ways away. I still decided to land there. I saw it. Yeah, we all I lied the to you. Massive open ground. Yeah. Like, I lied to you. I lied when I said that I just saw it at the last minute. No, I saw it from a long ways away. I was like, yeah, I got it. Oh, it's stuff in there. It's green. I'm such a sucker for green grass on land. It really am. God, I cannot tell you how fucking tiger country it was back there. I was so low. And then little Sarah coming on the radio. Harry, do you copy? I'm like, oh my God. 
people. Fuck, that was good. What an emotional roller coaster. I saw it today though. I saw it. I paid attention. I was like, look at this. Look at this. I am so lonely right now and I'm so fucking deep and the only way out is through. Hey. Here we go. The only way out is through. Profound. It's profound. I was really trying to make it back to family taco night tonight at 6, but that did not happen. But yeah, that's my longest flight from Pine Mountain. That's something like, I don't know, 185 kilometers. Uh, my track log is more like, you know, the track log length is 200 miles. Um, but yeah, 185K. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. I really hope that the getting spit out thing starts to make sense. I guess the biggest point on that is like when you get low, don't let yourself get panicky because panicky makes you try something instead of like becoming very sensitive to what's actually happening, sensitive to the air and what's around. And um, yeah, I think that's what you need when, when that kind of stuff happens. So I hope this is helpful. Subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends and consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Thank you so much. See you on the next episode.